Last Sunday night, we talked about judging Jesus and some of the false ideas they had about who Jesus was. But who is Jesus really? We'll discuss that tonight from John chapter 8. We are out at the Sawyer's Farm um, where my mom and daddy live out in Liberty, Tennessee in the middle of Weekly County. And we're glad that you are with us. Gordon is over here. Melody's here. Garrett Gannon's back over here. And uh, we're enjoying the, uh, the outdoors in Tennessee, but we're thankful for this time that we can study with you from the Gospel of John. You know, we talked about last Sunday night, John 7, and all these opinions about Jesus. Uh, we are, um, we got kind of interrupted a little bit on Wednesday night from John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, with the story of the woman taken in adultery. We talked about the other night, uh, what a, you know, great, powerful lesson that is for us. But we also talked about how the the oldest and best manuscripts we have don't have that. While we think that's a historical event that happened in the life of Jesus, we're not sure that it belongs in Scripture exactly right there. Uh, because the oldest and best manuscripts we have don't have it in that location. Uh, so if you think about it, our context is really going all the way back into chapter 7. In chapter 7, you recall that Jesus had gone to the Feast of Booths, and in chapter 7 and verse uh, 14 about is where he actually gets to Jerusalem uh, and goes into the temple and begins to teach. And so if you are not interrupted by the story of the woman taken in adultery, what you're left with is this same conversation uh, that ended off in chapter 7 with all of these different opinions uh, that they had in verse 52, and then you go right into Jesus continuing his uh, speaking. So in verse 12 of chapter 8, when it says again, Jesus spoke to them, he's still at the temple, he's still speaking to these same people that are there at the Feast of Booths, he's still having this conversation about who he is. They've, they've given all these false opinions, and remember, we talked about how that really chapter 7 and 8, the main idea that you want to keep in mind is from verse 24. When Jesus told them to not judge according to appearances, but to judge according to righteous judgment. And as we get into chapter 8 and verse 12, it says, Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. They're still making the incorrect judgment. Now remember, we talked about how that in the Feast of Booths, how that there was a, a real significance to both uh, light and water. And Jesus had talked about at the end of chapter 7, this idea about him being the, the uh, water that brings life, and uh, which reminded us of John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. The other thing that was significant in the, uh, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles in the way they celebrated it was lights. They had these little lamps that they would put at their, at their tables and that type of thing. And, and this idea of being the light of the world is, is really something that um, is not a new uh, metaphor for them uh, to, to be uh, um, introduced to. Uh, all through the Old Testament, uh, you see that in Exodus chapter 13, uh, verses 21 through 22, about the God being the light that led the people. Psalm 27, verse 1, Psalm 119, 105, and how His Word was a lamp to their feet and a light to their path. Proverbs 6, 23, even Isaiah 49 and verse 6. So you've got all of these references to the light, God being the light, and the Messiah, how that he was going to bring light into the world. And that's what we saw even from the beginning of John in chapter 1 and verse 9. It talked about him being the light that's come into the world. And uh, he talked about that in chapter 3 and verse 19. Uh, even in 1 John chapter 1, uh, he's going to, John, when he writes his epistles, are going to continue with that thought of, 
You know, you've got to walk in the light as he is in the light. Now, when we get to chapter 9, he's going to have a, an extended discussion about being the light when he talks about after he heals the blind man. But Jesus is the light of the world. And notice what he says. He says, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When we talk about in 1 John chapter 1, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, well, how do we walk in the light? Well, this verse, chapter 12 of John 8, tells us, how do you walk in the light? You follow Jesus. Whoever follows me, he says, will not walk in darkness, but will walk in the light. See, following Jesus is how we walk in the light. Jesus wants them to know who he is because he wants them to follow him. He doesn't want them to have all these false ideas about him. He wants them to understand who he is. He wants us to understand who he is because he wants you to follow him too. He wants you to walk in light and not in darkness. So the Pharisee said to him, verse 13, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Yeah, it's easy for you to say that about yourself, but remember we talked about this in chapter 5, how that that uh, they, they were required to have two or more witnesses. And they're saying, you're not, you don't have that. All you've got is you. Well, that's false. We've already saw in chapter 5, beginning in verse 19, all this list of witnesses that, that Jesus brought to the table. You remember that? That the Holy Spirit was a witness, and John the Baptist was a witness, and God the Father was a witness, and the works that Jesus did was a witness, and Moses was a witness, and the Scriptures were a witness. All these different things are witnesses. And beyond that, in the Gospel of John, we've had that, right? We've had in John chapter 2 the disciples believing in him after he turned the water to wine. In John chapter 3, we had Nicodemus coming to him saying, you know, we know you're sent from God because nobody can do what you're doing unless they were sent from God. John chapter 4, we had the woman at the well that said, you know, I think I found the Christ. And then the people later on said, you know, we first believed because of what you said, but now we've spent time with him. We've heard what he has to say, and we know that he's the Savior of the world. You've got all of these different witnesses to who Jesus is. Jesus isn't the only one saying this, but that's what they accuse him of. Of doing in verse 13 so Jesus answered in verse 14 even if I do bear witness about myself my testimony is true for I know where I came from and where I'm going but you do not know where I came from or where uh, where I'm going well we already had that discussion back in chapter 7 in verses 33 through 36 you remember that how that they thought he knew where he was from but they didn't really know where he was from right and uh, and so Jesus says even if I am the only witness about who I am, that, that doesn't mean that what I'm saying is wrong. It's still right. You just don't know what you think you know. You don't know as much as I do for sure. Because I know where I came from, and I also know where I'm going. Well, where did he come from? He came from God. He came from heaven. He came from above. We saw that in chapter 1. We saw that in chapter 3. Um, specifically like 31 through 34 of chapter 3, we saw that. He says in verse 15, You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. That reminds us back in chapter 7 and verse 24. Don't judge according to appearance, that would be the flesh, but judge righteous judgment. If you look at verse 51, uh, Nicodemus, remember when he's standing up for Jesus a little bit? He says, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? See, you're not judging me properly. You're not judging me righteously. They're judging unrighteous judgment. Okay? And so Jesus says, I judge no one. Now, Jesus is not saying that, that he's not going to judge. We've already saw him saying in chapter 5 that one day he's going to judge. You remember that? There's going to be a day of judgment. And on the day of judgment, Jesus is going to be the judge. Okay? What he's saying is, again, keeping it in context, I'm not judging unrighteously like you are. Alright? So he's fixing, to, he's fixing to judge them. But what I'm judging is not unrighteous judgment. He, he's wanting to save is what he... He's not wanting to condemn at this time. Um, but the fact that he's here is going to draw a line 
between those who believe and who do not believe. He says, yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. He's not saying I don't judge at all, but but in my judgment when I judge is perfect. It's not like your judgment, because my judgment is based on what the Father has said. See, I'm the spokesperson for the Father. Remember chapter 1 says that He came to explain the Father, to exegete the Father, so that we can know the Father. He's the spokesman for the Father. And what I'm saying is coming from my Father, He says. Uh, the Father who sent me. It's not like your judgment. My judgment is based on what's really the case. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. He says in verses 17 and 18, In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Remember, they said, you say this about yourself. And Jesus says, well, even if I am the only one that says it about me, what I'm saying is true. And the reason what I'm saying is true is because I'm speaking for the Father. So let's think about what, what your, your standard is. Your law says that, if, that for it to be considered true, you have to have two witnesses. Well... If two witnesses is what you want, there's the Father and there's me. And that's two witnesses. The Father is the witness that trumps everybody, right? I mean, if there's one witness you can count on, it's the Father. But I've got Him and I've got me. I'm the one that speaks for Him. And so, uh, you know, that's what... You, you can't get around who I am. You've got the two testimonies. The only reason... That, uh, that, that you're having a problem is because you're rejecting me. It's because I don't fit what it is that you want me to fit. Okay? So, you know, they were right in wanting two witnesses. Uh, that, that's in Deuteronomy 17 and Deuteronomy 19. But Jesus says you've got two witnesses. You've got me and you've got the Father. Again, chapter 5, he's got way more than that. But you've got the two. The, the only problem in you seeing who I really am is that I don't fit what you want. So, But I want you to see who I really am. I don't want you to have all these false opinions about me. Remember what, all the things they were saying back in chapter uh, chapter 7? Uh, he's a good man. Well, he leads the people astray. Well, he's got a demon. Well, when he, the Christ comes, will he do more works than this guy? Well, we know where the Christ comes from, and this guy's not from the right place. And you know all these wrong ideas that they had about. I want you to know who I am, so I'm giving you the witnesses that you need. So they answer verse 19. They said to him, "Therefore, where is your father?" See, they still don't get it. That that reminds us back. Back in chapter 5 and verse 42, chapter 5 and verse 42, uh, they said, but Jesus says, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I come in my Father's name and you do not receive me. If another came in his name, you would receive him. They, the, the fact that if it was anybody else, they wouldn't be asking this question. He said, I, you've got me as a witness and you've got my Father as a witness. And they're saying, well, who is your Father then? They, they think they know who his father is. Remember when they were mumbling against him before, they said, isn't this Joseph the carpenter's son? See, that's who they're thinking. But that's not who he's talking about. And he's already made that apparent to them. Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. Well, why don't they know him? Because they're of the, remember back in John chapter 1 and verse 10, it says the world would not receive him because they did not know him. That's why they won't receive him, because they don't. Jesus said, "You don't know me," and the reason you don't know me is because you don't know my Father. You can't take the Father without taking me, which we've seen several times in the Gospel of John. See, your life reflects uh, who you are. Uh, you know, you can claim to be whatever, but but your life is going to reflect who you really are and whose you really are. That's what Jesus is saying is, is that, that your, your relationship with the Father is on trial here. And uh, it, it's, it's kind of like you've heard the, 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 uh, the old illustration about if your Christianity was on trial, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's what he's saying in this verse is, 
is that if you knew my father, you'd know me if you knew my father also. The fact is, is that, that you're on trial and, and, and your relationship with the father, there's not enough to convict here, see? Um, it's one of those things that, that we've got to think about ourselves is that it is, we can claim to be followers of God. We can claim to be followers of Jesus all day, but are we real? You know, one of the things that frustrates me is how that overall, this is with it's a lot of us, but especially with guys, we're so um, willing to accept mediocrity when it comes to our relationship with God. The only area in which we would accept mediocrity. I heard a guy talking about, he said, you know, if you're if your football coach or your favorite team went three and nine, would you accept that? You know, I mean, um, we're Tennessee Vols fans. Um, if if the ten, if Pruitt goes three and nine for two seasons, they're gonna can him. Now we're hoping that doesn't happen because we've been through enough coaches here lately. But it's because they won't accept mediocrity. They're they hadn't found the, the winning coach yet, but they're still trying to find it because it's not good enough. And we'll talk about, you know, participation trophies and that type of thing and how awful that is. Christianity is the one area that participation trophies is good enough for us. We think we can just show up and be there at the building and we get a participation trophy. It's more than just mediocrity that God demands. These people were going through the motions. Sometimes we just go through the motions. And that's not good enough. See? We can claim anything. But what are you really doing to show it? And that's what Jesus is telling them here. It says in verse 20, These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. So verse 20 is a cool verse because first of all, it tells us that he's in the treasury. Okay, He is uh, still in the temple. And, uh, you know, they're they're wanting to know who he is. Well, he's at his father's house, (laughs) walking around like he owns the place. Because he kind of does. You know, I mean... That's where he's at. He has been back since chapter 7 and verse 14. He's at his father's house. He's speaking these things in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And to a certain extent, that kind of shows what's going on here because who he is because he's getting away with it. It says the second half of that verse, no one arrested him. Anybody else walking around the temple, especially in the treasury, what's going to happen to them? Well, they're going to haul them out there, especially if they're walking around saying, I'm God. But you know the reason why they couldn't? Because his hour had not yet come. That, that's what it says here. Uh, th- that's what, what we saw earlier in chapter 7. That's what we saw. We've seen that over and over again. His time had not yet come. You know what this is really saying? You know the real reason they didn't arrest him? It's because he's in charge. He's in the temple and he's in charge. Guess who Jesus is? He's God. And that's why he's because he's in charge. Sometimes things go bad in our lives and we wonder and worry and we we we're just all in an uproar about just remember he's in charge. Okay? Sometimes it things don't happen on our time, but God's timeline is always better than ours anyway. Verse 21, it says, So he said to them again. Well, he's told them what he's going to tell them in chapter 7, verse 33, in chapter 7, verse 34, in chapter 7, 36, in verse 14 here in chapter 8. And now he's telling them again, I'm going away, and you will seek me, and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. Jesus says, I'm going to go away, and he's clearly talking about his death. And they get that because... They're going to talk about that later on. When he goes away, when he dies, he says, you're going to seek me and you'll die in your sin. Why is that the case? Because they're they're going to be seeking the Messiah. Jews to this day are still seeking the Messiah. Not, Not 
necessarily seeking Jesus, but they're still going to be seeking the Messiah. And what you're not getting is that the Messiah has come and He's in your presence and I'm going to die to redeem you and because you reject me, you're going to die in your sins because you're still going to be looking for the Messiah when the Messiah's already come and died for you and redeemed you and you won't submit to Him because you won't believe Him. You're still going to be looking for Him. He's already come and gone. You're not going to follow, find Him, so you're going to die in your sins. So the Jews said, and this again shows that they knew He was talking about dying, the Jews said, will he kill himself since he says, "Why well, I'm going, you cannot come? Remember back in chapter 3, they said, well, uh, maybe he's going to the Greeks. Chapter 7, they said, maybe he's going to... They're just trying... There's all of this question of where is he going? Well, eventually in John chapter 14, he's going to tell us where he's going, right? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself. That where I'm, there you may be also. But there's all of this leading up to that in John. Where is he going? Where is he going? Verse 23 is another key passage in all this. He says to them, You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. you got to get this. Again, chapter 1 and verse 10 says they didn't receive him because they didn't, they didn't know him. They didn't recognize him. Uh, chapter 3 and verses 16 and 17, it's recorded in John that he wants us, he wants everyone to be saved, right? He doesn't want anyone to perish, but all, all to come to him. The problem is they just don't want him. And, and all the way in John chapter 15, when Jesus is talking to the disciples in that upper room, he's going to say, don't, don't be surprised when the world hates you because the world hates me. And if they hate me, they're going to hate you. They're rejecting him, and that's the problem with all of this, um, is that, that they're going to reject him. Um, he wants them, they just don't want him. Verse 24, I told you that you would die in your sins, which he's already told them that. They'd be seeking him, but they couldn't find him, so they'd die in their sins. He said, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, what's interesting is, here's another one of those passages. Our translation here has, I am he, but the he is added. Translators added that to try to make it a complete sentence. But here's another one of those places in John where Jesus says, unless you believe, I am. That's what he said back in chapter 6 and verse 20 that they got tore up about. Remember that? He's going to say it again later on at the end of this chapter in verse 58. And they're, they're going to get what he's saying about himself. They get that that I am is kind of like Moses at the burning bush. It's, it's a terminology for deity. And when Jesus says, I am, at the end of this chapter, they're going to pick up stones ready to stone him. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. You've got to get in, in sync with who I am. He wants them to know who he is. He didn't want them to have all these bad ideas. He didn't want them to have all these false opinions. I want you to know who I am. And I am God. So they said to him, Who are you? Do what? <laughs> after, all we've, after all we've discussed, well, who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. And really, their question is, it's not a sincere question. Jesus says, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. They're not saying, oh, well, who are you? Because he's already told them. Their question is more like, well, who do you think you are? You're walking around here in the treasury of the temple like you own the place. You're telling us that unless we believe that you are, that, that we're going to die in our sins, that, that you're from the Father, that where you're going, we can't. who do you think you are to tell us that we're not in a right relationship, that we're not in sync with God, that we're of the world. Who do you think you are? To, to say something like that um, 
to us. Jesus says just what I've been telling you from the beginning. Jesus has been telling them from the very start who he is. They just don't want to listen. See, But again, the, the reason that they ask this question, just who are you? Who do you think you are to tell us that? It's because they're offended that Jesus would say these things to them, that Jesus would call them out. Because we're the, we're the ones that have the right relation. We're God's people. And for you to tell us we, we don't know God, we're the only ones that do know God. For you to tell us that we're not going to be saved, we're the only ones that are going to be saved. For you to tell us we don't know what we're talking about, we're the only ones that know what we're talking about. Right? See, sometimes it may hurt our feelings, but sometimes we need people to call us out. And, and ask us, are we really what we claim to be? You know, I heard somebody say one time, and I, I don't know that it's not, not the truth. The hardest thing to do in America, in evangelism, is to convince people who have grown up thinking they're Christians, who have lived their lives thinking they're Christians, to realize that they're not really Christians. People in the world that have a some sort of belief in Jesus, that are following false doctrines, that think they're Christians to, to make them believe they really are Christians. People in the church, even, that we think because I'm a member of the church, because I was baptized when I was, you know, whatever age, because I take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week, because we don't have a piano in our building, whatever, all of these kinds of things. Well, I'm a Christian. And getting those people to realize you're not a Christian. You're a part of the, the club that your parents raised you up in. You see what I'm saying? There's a difference in being a follower of Jesus and claiming to be a Christian. And it takes more than just getting wet. And it takes more than just, just having the building set up the right way. It's a relationship that we've got to take seriously and grow in. Does that make sense? And it's hard to get people like me that were raised in the church to get that maybe there's something missing in my life, missing in my relationship with God, missing in the way that I follow Jesus. we got to help people see that, that it's more to it than just that. Who are you? To say that to us is what they asked Jesus, and that may be what we're asking somebody. Verse 26, Jesus says, I have much to say about you and much to judge, but he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world that I have heard from them. Jesus doesn't like the world to continue to live in sin. So that's why he's saying, "There's, I, I, I'm trying to bring light to you. I'm trying to bring light to the world. I'm trying to show you what is true. I'm trying to declare this to the world. And you keep rejecting who I am. Who am I? I've showed you. And I've told you. And I've tried to be the light for you. But you keep rejecting me. Verse 27, they did not understand that he had been speaking to them about the Father. How many times has he talked about the Father so far? Think about, sometimes it helps us to think about the trajectory here. Think about what he says to them. He says to them in the past few verses, verse, uh, verse 23, he says that, that you're in sin because you're part of the world. Verse 24, he says you've got to believe if you want to be saved. Uh, verse 25, they say, who do you think you are to tell us that? And then what he says in verse 26 and 27 is, I've been telling you over and over again that the Father sent me to judge you. And when I judge you, I find that you're not in the right, you're not, your heart's not right in the sight of God. But I also came to redeem you. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You see what's going on here? Jesus is calling them out, but he's also telling them, I, I didn't just come to tell you that you're wrong. I came to tell you how you can be right. See, when we reject Jesus, we reject the way to get right. 
in verse 28, and so Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, now that lifted up, we've talked about this before, chapter 3, verses 4 through 15, when he talked about the Moses lifting up the brass serpent, uh, chapter 12, he's going to, this lifting up terminology is lifting up on the cross, his, his dying on the cross. When you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. Well, that's what he said back in chapter 5, verse 19 and following. What I'm teaching you has come from the Father. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Jesus is the only one that could say that, right? That I always do the things that are pleasing to the Father. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. Well, you go back to chapter 7, and, and you see how that all this has come about. Verse 31, yet many of the people believed in him. Uh, verse 36, many of the people believed him, and they're believing him as they're going through this conversation about who he is. Remember verse 46 of chapter 7. The officer said, no one spoke like this man. This is a slow progression in their faith and their belief in him, but it's coming. Now, we'd say we we're going to cover the whole chapter 8, but there's just too much good stuff in here. So we're going to Wednesday night finish that up. But think about what's happened so far in chapter 8. After this big discussion in chapter 7 about all these opinions about Jesus, Jesus says, let me tell you who I am. I'm the one sent from the Father. I'm the light of the world. And I had to come to show you that, that where you think you are is not where you really are, to judge you in that way, and to show you that there's a, a clear line marking between where you ought to be and where you are. But I, only, I not only came to do that, I came to redeem you, to give you a path back to God. If you believe in me, you can have that. But the key is, you, you can't reject me. And when, we, when we're not following Jesus... When we're not walking in His Word, when we're not doing the things He wants us to do, that's what we're doing is rejecting Him. And if we're rejecting Him, we don't have any hope at all. See? You believe in Jesus because you know who He is. And when you believe in Jesus, then you have the hope that He brings, the redemption that He brings, the relationship that He brings. Are you with me? It begins with knowing who Jesus is. Now, in the rest of this chapter, we're going to have three more of those truly, truly, amen, amen statements that we've seen throughout John that's going to help us even further see who Jesus is. And Lord willing, we'll talk about that this coming Wednesday night. Let's end with a prayer. Our Father, we're thankful for this beautiful Lord's Day. We're thankful for the time that we have to study your word. We're thankful for who Jesus is, that as God the Son, he was willing to put on flesh and come to this earth to show us what a relationship with you should like, look like, and to give us the opportunity to have that kind of relationship with you. Thank you, Father, for what you have done through Jesus. Thank you for his willingness to pay the price for us. Thank you for your spirit, and thank you, Father, for uh, your word that, that has revealed to us all these things about Jesus and about you. Help us, Father, to not settle for mediocrity as we follow Jesus. Help us not to just claim to be followers of Jesus, but to truly follow him, to seek a, a full and deeper relationship with you. Help us to love you more and to show your love to everybody that we come into contact with. And it's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, we're thankful again that you have joined us for another Bible study in John. We hope you'll be back Wednesday night as we continue to look at who Jesus is in chapter 8. We hope that you'll take the time to comment uh, where you're at and that you will like and share uh, this uh, this class uh, in the whatever uh, area of social medias that you're in. Uh, we hope you'll be back with us on Wednesday night, and we hope that you'll remember that we love you, and God does too. Have a great week.
if you'll click here, you'll get a list of all of these videos that in, in this series. If you click here, then you will get the last study. If you click up here, then you'll be uh, subscribed to the Bear Valley Church of Christ YouTube channel.